great honor to have today with us uh, Professor Gerich. My God, I need that many people while making the introduction. And um, thanks all the people online and thanks all the people here. I, uh, um, I don't know, I mean, I think you all know him, but I, formally I, I am I'm very glad to introduce you. So, uh, Guido Gerich was um, already assistant professor a uh, time ago in Zurich, then he moved to Chapel School, where I think it's a period where we meet. Uh, in one of those um, guys, so I don't know how many years, I mean, at least more than 20. That's okay, that's 2000 or something. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. But we know it's yeah. started since now, I realized more than 20 years that we have been in this Nikai crowd, so it's a really a great honor to have you. And then you moved to uh, Utah, in the yes. like exactly. And then uh, this is in Utah, is where uh, this scene was uh, in, in there, I think. And, Bene as well, she was in Utah. No, it's no, Bene. 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 Exactly. Bene. And um, yes, and now he moved uh, to the University of, of New York. And on the top of the, so what I remember mostly is, is like at the time I was mostly interested in the work of uh, Marcel. Pashala, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. uh, it was a lot on already on segmentation and newborns. And there was as well, uh, we did, we did, we did. We did. We did. Yes, it's your surgery. Exactly. So, uh, two yeah. More, two more <laughs> so, two more segmentation, of course. I was working on, on two more with my PhD. So, this is what I remember. And of course, he's expert in many of the tools that you are maybe not so familiar with because I'm not longer so much used, like active contours. <laughs> uh, we were a lot as well on shape analysis, even graphs. I remember myself was working with graphs. A lot of shape. Yeah. It's shape. Spiritual harmonics. And it's fantastic. So, yes. And on the top of this, as you know, he's uh, the founder of IPK Snap that we love. Like just. Uh, and. Uh, yeah. <laughs> in the community. Yeah. So yeah. It's uh, 25 years so uh, yeah. I still have the first version. Ah! <laughs> it's still it's running. Still user, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. It shows how good but it is. We have also to be ready to polish the rich because okay. he took on and put it into the IPK. But the basic idea came from us. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. We need a tool easy to use. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You manage. You yeah. succeed, guys. Congratulations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We love it. So yeah, without more delay, I let you okay. present the work. Thank it's a much. great honor. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction. I would say keep it informal. So yeah. if you don't mind, I sit and don't jump around. Uh, so credit goes to my students. So if you say he's expert, I think my students are experts. <laughs> so, so really, uh, I always have the pleasure to find good students or excellent students. I can motivate to drive the research. So let me move on. So I'm currently at NYU, so I moved around as you heard. So it's now the eighth year at NYU. It's the largest private university in the US, uh, in the middle of New York, amazing location, if you like the big city. Uh, I'm at the engineering school. Uh, it was former Polytechnic, now it's called NYU Engineering School. We, computer science and engineering, have the largest together with Courant, Courant Institute of Math and CS. They also have a computer science. We have two computer science departments, but they are part of the largest programs in regard to bachelor's and master's students. So every year we have 1,300 students to our pipeline. Uh, I mean, we are proud that everybody so far got the job. Now students are really great because companies lay off. But hopefully we still be back soon. Okay, so motivation. Uh, we started very early to think about time because it was really motivated not only to the ethics, but everything that I heard from clinician was all this. Ah, when we do baseline follow up, even if you see the dogs or you get the temperature measurement, and they say, oh, I give you some pills and come back in a week and we will see if you get better. And that's also true for imaging. So we moved to longitudinal studies. Unfortunately, uh, in our lab, we had to be chance to work with different groups all over the US who really had large scale longitudinal studies. Development, degeneration, disease progression, everything has to work uh, longitudinal. And even, I mean, pediatrics, aging, even glaucoma. So we now started two new projects uh, where we study the formation of the laminar fibrosa of the human eye. 
due to pressure or even A and B, age related network regeneration. It's all about follow up too, because you have to scan patients multiple times and see what is the progression of the disease to better understand. Okay, so I follow here. <laughs> I use the slides with Marco Lorenzi and he did it so nicely. <laughs> I mean, this is more the paradigm of longitudinal versus cross section. So if you have a measure, whatever it is, time, disease versus no, whatever we have. But usually in cross section studies, we just take a snapshot and say, hopefully, we find a peanut, you know, something significant at the age bracket or so. Or some patients that compare in demographics. But we see in many studies, especially I work in mental illness, the changes are very subtle. So if you have a cross section study, changes or differences are so subtle that the variability of two groups is larger than the changes. And that leads to the problem, yeah, but couldn't we do a longitudinal assessment? Uh, if you have a PT data, we could do modeling of a trajectory over time. This is also in the spirit of personalized health care. They say everybody has a different trajectory and even, especially infants, every child has a different trajectory during the first year. It may normalize more and become not so uh, distinguishable, but the first year is amazing how different everyone is. Even if you have children at home, two kids, they can be very different. Okay, so that's more the the uh, topic uh, that we had first, I mean, I don't have to go through all that, but every work is probably always a PhD thesis. <laughs> uh, usually it's four to five years in the US, uh, depending on if you come in as a bachelor's or master's student. Uh, first of all, template building. So I'm sure you're familiar with these template building tools mm -hmm. that you started very early. What is the average image out of the population? And a lot of people worked on. And interestingly, my colleagues are on Shoshi at Utah and Brian Evans and Chi Chi worked on the same topic with nearly the same solution and published it in the same journal at the same year. So it was interesting. Both got invited and we went to the conference. To it was history or something. And both talked about the same and didn't really know each, about each other. So it was not plagiarism or stealing. They just had mathematically a little bit different approach. But both had exactly the same in mind. Given a population of image, give me the fashemi in a deformable sense. Well, that's that's it. So we still use the tools. I mean, I think everybody uses the ad software. We use them. Uh, science is not really available for everyone. We didn't really spend a lot of time to go through what Brian Allen's work was a postdoc for years to make the software tool that everybody can use. That's another step. Yeah. But it's in principle the same. And it's unbiased. That's why you call it unbiased. You don't use a template and then iterate till the template moves to the middle. Okay, so, and then you may know the time extension is just instead of an atlas, just once uh, you create, do I have, ah, I have it here. You create an atlas over time because you can have a time series, even here cross sexual, that was the first that we did uh, 2006 to 10 with uh, Brad Davis and Tom Fletcher, who was also my colleague at Utah. What you do is you generate the template at a specific time point. And it's relatively straightforward for us as computer scientists to think about it. You delay images that are far away in age. You just say I have a kernel, and the far away the age is, the less I make this contribution. So you just go through the age axis here and generate a middle template of the neighborhood in age. And that leads to Ah, you see here, David. Yes, sir. This is a female at that time cross section because you cannot do a study from 20 to 18 with the same subject. So, or not yet. So, we will have data sometime. But it really created a template over time, which was kind of first at the time. We could mm -hmm. not really do a movie. It was not really in population. That's different because we did it from a population of science. So, it existed. Pashemin over time, basically. 
So just interrupt me if something is not clear or if uh, so of course now also in this group I see we like more learning based approaches and so can we also do something or is that an alternative? It's not always an alternative. Uh, you cannot really model it in the same way that we do with the uh, with the uh, more civil processing approaches where you can actually create the model, even the trajectory of the model, numbers, functional, logistic functions, or whatever we use. But uh, our students came across Adrian's, uh, Adrian Dalkas, mm -hmm. uh, Box Room Moth. And I must say, when I first heard about it, I thought, cool. <laughs> I, I was a little bit suspicious. How can you create an atlas with learning? But I was struck by I was struck by this uh, multiple covariance. I liked Watson more not because it was a tool to generate an atlas, but because you can embed covariance into the framework. And I will have a few slides because that means now we get closer to clinical use because in a clinical environment, uh, especially in our studies at UNC. We have this autism study, uh, kids between six and 24. We always say, can you send me a template of a child at 12 months, but the female? Okay, we take some data sets, female, 12 months, generate an atlas and send it to this lab. And then another one wants to have only male, another one wants to have whatever. So I would say the multiple covariates really offers now the, I, so let me first uh, continue. Uh, First of all, if you have any form of the template, as you said before, we have this problem of irregularly sampled data. I think everyone has that. Mm -hmm. You never have a continuous data set from, I don't know, prenatal to two years. Mm -hmm. And at sample, sample size, which is the same at each age bracket, because most studies, except radiology, maybe pediatric, they just take a child with those indication to do an MRI and then you get the MRI at any time. But in every clinical study, we like to cluster this and bring them in at six months because then we know and then the birthday comes up. It's a bring them in at 12 months plus cognitive assessment that everyone has a time point which could be fixed. So then you have a, an uneven distribution and that's another problem for all these atlas theory. Okay, but anyway. Appearance changes, and I know you deal a lot with that mm -hmm. because the first year is a really huge development, and the MRI contrast is just a snapshot into some physical properties, which doesn't tell you everything about the microstructure. So you have a lot of contrast changes due to exome uh, elimination, to myelination, to the protocol itself that we use. So these are all. <laughs> Uh, okay, so is it six months that we have this sort of contrast? No, it's not exactly six months. Uh, uh, it's between five and seven, and it depends on the developmental More maturation. Of the, yeah. And there is even, uh, I don't have a slide here. We always looked at the book of Mary Rutherford, mm -hmm. uh, the Kings mm -hmm. College, where she served. <laughs> She she always said the T2 contrast is delayed by about two months. And you see that when you go to a movie, oh. I think I had that. I only have the T1. Then you see that the contrast reversal, that means white and gray never show the contrast for a T1 scan is around six months plus minus in three weeks, but in a T2 scan, it comes later. Okay. So it's it's interesting, multi-modalities are multi-modalities because they are a little bit of oh, and they're yeah. totally the same. Uh, okay, so we have here ends, uh, non-trivial for each sample. We still have to treat it for every study that we do, whether you have OCT images in the ophthalmology or another set. One student who really gets an expert tells another student how to do all these parameters, multi-scale and how many iterations? So still, it requires thinking uh, uh, of the parameters. On the other hand, it's worldwide used and it's successful. It has been shown in some papers as the best, easiest to use or public tool that we are convinced about. It really does an excellent job. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, now, voxel morph, really high training costs. I mean, you know, that following voxel morph, you have to feed in a lot of data. Uh, but then, of course, once you have that network, you know, that tool, you can generate the image. I mean, just a fraction of a second or a second, you need to be three dimensional because ants still require speed resources. So, we usually do it on a high performance computing system if you have 200 images or more. Uh, but now there is a modeling flexibility, flexibility which uh, my students like very much. So we work with Adrian Dalka. So it's not that he just says what's the more is not good enough, but we looked at the tool and it, there was Neil Day, who is now a postdoc at MIT, and published it at ICCU. And he found his scans are very unstable, they're not so robust. It's beautiful. You explain it to the students if you do a course lecture, but again, by itself, has to be made robust. If you would say, I have a tool, I give it to everyone, you feed in images and it's perfect, and it's not true at all. So, uh, so he developed this uh, tool with Adrian's group at MIT uh, and another student in our group. I don't want to go into all the details, uh, template generation subnetwork, registration subnetwork. It's a deformable registration. Mm -hmm. Of course, you also have to minimize uh, via the Jacobian. Mm -hmm. that we have typical points which are invalid. So it's, <laughs> a, a, it's different. It's different morphic, but of course, in a deep learning sense, yeah. you don't have to map. No, I exactly. mean, you have map. But you minimize the uh, negative, uh, uh, norm. you have a Jacobian norm of the Jacobian, and you minimize the negative voxels or something. Okay. Because that would be invalid. You have an over, over, how can I say, overfolding of space. Mm -hmm. I think it's done in a training, or how can I say that, sense that you minimize those points where mm -hmm. you have invalid okay. morphism. On the other hand, even in ants, Think about two brains that we register. They are not diffeomorphic. We have different foldings of the cortex. Maybe the ventricles have some small little sections which you don't really see. There is a there is a tube, but the resolution doesn't show it to you. Even the ventricles are not equivalent in the diffeomorphic sense of topology will be violated. So mm -hmm. in that sense, if we look at the diffeomorphism, we always have the thin lines. In the ants, or uh, as I was sure she it's beautiful. You look at it, it's invertible theoretically, but then you have the lines that have to make sure that the space doesn't overflow. Mm -hmm. I would just say this was really the work that Neil Day and uh, Molly and Gwen in our lab did, that they tweaked the whole system, adding new components that they, and you will see the results. That they saw there's more that we can do to stabilize it, but also to significantly improve the quality. So now <laughs> that's why I like the voxel morph very much because uh, uh, I don't know if you know about the computer vision uh, toolbox here, like span age. There are 70,000 portraits of images. I don't know how they collected them, it's one of these Google things or. You know, <laughs> Just feed in all the images and say, but ah, they have age, traditions are male, female, and sunglasses are glasses. Uh, that's more a toy example, which you publish mm -hmm. in CDPR or ICC, uh, but you have a large set of images. Now you do the modeling with the Atlas that uh, Neil, Moe, and Adrian created. And now you can see the results with this framework because you have to show you. ICC paper that this is better than what we had before. I mean, we do all this validation. Now you see you can generate, you just ask, it's a query, it's like a database. Give me a child at age seven to nine females. Okay, and then you got it. And visually for me, it looks pretty good. So these results are better than we have seen published. So you have female, male, age zero to 70. Female with glasses, 
It was difficult for the baby because there are no baby. And now I see yeah, another baby. Yeah, smart, they have Italian style. Uh, <laughs> they have. Uh, in the database, there were not so many. That's how I see this child doesn't really have sunglasses. But anyway, you see, it's template building where co covariance uh, or additional parameters are age. That's important for us. And then male, female, or whatever category you have in our combined databases like autism, kids high risk for autism, diagnosis for autism, pressure lax, controls, Down syndrome, all of this the same protocols into a huge database. And then there is this covariance, which is bringing the templates out, or you can even compare mm -hmm. them. So here we use it on the DHCP data. So you have it here too, or mm -hmm. use it. Okay. Uh, 20 to 44 weeks uh, using this framework to generate a model. Uh, I mean, it's a huge database and very nicely quality controlled. So, but it's controlled only. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, then we compared it. You know that uh, we, use, we use that for lectures and we talk to students about registration. A linear average always gives you a blurry image. These are more the old templates that we got from MNI, MNI mm -hmm. Montreal in the very early days. I would not say that it was not good enough, but we liked blurry templates because it was easier to register an mm -hmm. image, not to a sharp image, but to a blurry because then you get it more or less. <laughs> Uh, so, but you see here linear average. Uh, oh, there's a cursor here. Yes. And box and morph, same data set, and now ours. I <laughs> think that's uh, the new one, ICCD. And you clearly see here at the level of the singulum, here it's all blurry, of course, linear, but even ends. It works very well for templates that are not too sharp, but you could never segment this image. Mm -hmm. uh, then Roxy Moore still had some problems with invalid morphology because this is uh, the single room. Mm -hmm. The single room is split up into two. I mean, the tool doesn't know anything about the natural bit. It just creates the middle image, but there's no truth. But it seems that we compare even uh, zoomed in sections that the new version is much more stable, robust, and takes much sharper images. We even think we could segment those images from the atlas to get the new template or a segmentation template in a continuous way over the whole lifespan or a range of ages. Just sorry, I was about to ask you. So you are not using any segmentation like that to for the registration. No, just using no, the images and your covariance. What images. you're saying now it's a posteriori to just do the same with any yes. prior template. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that could come. I mean, yeah. I asked Neil, I mean, there is no, you could do it on dual echo. I think we did an Atlas and a T1, T2 scan. Mm -hmm. and why not just feeding it the label map? I would just say yes, but the PhD student could tell me, no, you're wrong. It's not so easy to do it. The mm -hmm. label map is binary, but I'm sure you could do it. Because mm -hmm. for harmonization, we use ground truth and we have much better results if you want to but it's a good question. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could feed in probably label maps, but then how do you interpolate label maps? Uh, <laughs> or probabilities. I was more thinking like that. Like like yeah. Like yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, you're right. Okay, so we get now these uh, yeah, movies. Mm -hmm. And I have here a comparison. Look, oh, here, I switch back after. See, Roxy Moth, it should be a movie. <laughs> uh, hours. And what is evident, especially here, is in our version, you really see a strong deformation in the mid section. Yes. Right? You see the cerebellum mm -hmm. moving. When you look at the Roxy more, what? Well, nothing happens. So it tends to be over regularized. So I would not criticize mm -hmm. ATN's tool. It's a wonderful tool. But if you go for deformations, it's too much an average, uh, even over time. Uh, then we applied it to our uh, autism data set. Uh, we have over a thousand images. They are even increasing. Uh, we still need to study at six, 12, and 24 months. Even at discrete intervals, we get a pretty good model of the 
here quite never the contrast change in the T1. Unfortunately, I don't expect it to do as a movie. But and we started only at six months. Now mm -hmm. I really would like to go down to birth. Yesterday we had some questions mm -hmm. on even if you have pre pre data and then mm -hmm. uh, in Uto data. It would be just nice to see what the average is, what we expect, but then also apply it to an individual, uh, only not only to a population. But I would say, yeah, you see, this is the displacement field, and then the Jacobian of the displacement field. Uh, the color maps, some, I know this is the displacement field. We use the magnitude of the displacement field. That means how much deformation that each image has to the template as a criterion in the learning framework. We want to minimize deformations. That means the mean should be closer to all the images. So if the mean is out somehow, <laughs> then you have much more deformation. So we use it as a criteria to, to uh, to optimize the, the system. Uh, so the less we have the formations, the better the template, the sharper the template. Okay, code, everything is available. As, that's a nice artifact or side effect of learning based frameworks. You put it on GitHub, it's not a thousand pages of code, <laughs> nobody can install it. I think that's really a bonus that I see most groups doing this type of, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's a very nice website. So we uh, download everything, movies, everything. And uh, okay, so that's about template building, where I would say, especially the conditions. Uh, I like the conditions because now we can create large template databases and extract the subgroup that we need mm -hmm. and not create atlases based on 15 subjects or so. They are not very sharp. And, mm -hmm. uh, okay, so. That's the first one. Uh, then we had a recent paper at Uribs, uh, Mongway, and she was very proud that this was selected as a oral presentation. Mm -hmm. uh, also, she showed, oh, these oral presentations are from very different fields <laughs> from here to here. But on the other hand, it's good on the student CV. I mean, that's for your I career. So, yes, <laughs> good. Okay, it was local spatial temporal representation learning. So, this is part of our autism study. You see, this is a typical data that we get. We have 600 high risk for autism and 300 subjects controls, no history for autism family. And we started with six times 24 months, and now we added a school age, uh, school age and adolescence. So the study is growing in longitudinal axis. As they said in autism, yeah, we have all these diagnostic criteria, P24, we have a full diagnosis, we have cognitive assessment, it's a huge set of information. But now follow them up longer and see how does schooling, kindergarten, elementary school changes kind of the uh, cognitive assessment that we do in autism. And now we are at the adolescent stage. Mm -hmm. Now we even do a replication of the study. That was my question to Petra yesterday. If you have such a high impact study in mm -hmm. the field, can you verify that on a second completely independent sample? So we do the study again and try to replicate every finding that we had before. Okay, but here currently we usually do independent segmentations. So we say, okay, six month segmentation, 12, 24. We even have different methods. <laughs> we use the Prostava method mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. Now we use more the expectation maximization, yeah, even mm -hmm. Prostava. Yes. But then there was no template for a six month old, blah, blah, blah. So it's three different segmentations that we use. They all look very similar, finally, but they are surely not consistent in that sense. Mm -hmm. They don't know about each other. And the approach would be, can we do the longitudinal processing into the pipeline, learning base, that the pipeline knows that these are repeated data set of the same child. There must be a very strong link between them. Okay, so that's more the visual version of what I just said. We have data over time. Here I have three time points, so just the parameter. 
P1 to the segment of subcortical structures. Uh, and uh, Molly when we published this paper basically they did in our group uh, and not in China at the UNC. So can you improve segmentation if you use a longitudinal deformation? So yeah, uh, because we say if you segment, if you do segmentation independently, you make an assumption they are completely independent. Mm -hmm. It's not true. It's the six months, twelve months, like four. We once did a three D printing for fun. We had a three D printer in the lab, and then printed the brain white metal surface for this experiment. At six, four, they are like finger prints. They look exactly the same. No new folds or something. So there is really the structure geometry is alive. Even the subcortical structures, we look at them. It's like a memory game. You did once a memory game for a site visit of some uh, visitors in our lab and said, subcortical structures has small little. Oh, you know the memory game. Mm -hmm. I say, find the two that are the same. Of course, you find them because they are really alive. Okay, so uh, Mongwe developed the system first. Yeah, and six months, 12, 24, 76. We have a segmentation maybe at 36, which is even quality controlled by human experts. At UNC, we still have two, three experts and University of Minnesota. They do now again manual painting. Painting means segmentation of frames from seven Tesla and three that's Chad Ellison's group. So they said we cannot have a bias to an automatic segmentation. We have to redo it again. And then the question is yeah, if you apply it to a different image at a different time, you get a very bad output. So it's a poor generalization. So 36 months segmentation doesn't generalize well for a unseen domain of the neuroma. So, and what Mongray developed, and I would say, I cannot tell you all these details here. I must, I have to apologize. I would say it's all in paper. Uh, so it was a very complex framework that they developed by, by putting in small little uh, uh, regions and describing the causality or something, what do these regions have in common over time to put them to, that into the learning based framework. So it had two components, similarity of patches and dissimilarity of patches that you have to pull apart. So somehow using the similarity, and now you can be critical and say, ah, the contrast changes. And of course the contrast changes, but there was still Structural similarity that we could see, even if the contrast was kind of lower, but the ventric is all fluid or something else, or we said enough information that we find like pairs that have very similar contrast. So, and then uh, consistency loss and everything. So, it's a typical framework for those who fully understand learning based, I'm not sure. Uh, more people here than I am. I'm just the one who sells these ideas. <laughs> but, and then, uh, so the main idea was really leverage spatial temporal correlation in the pre training. And we didn't find a lot of papers in the literature. Uh, we can never say we are the first because groups develop something, go to archives, and then it's out. And they say, yeah, you didn't read my paper because I just published it a week ago. But there was not a lot of temporal learning-based analysis or images that we found based on learning-based approaches. Mm -hmm. Anyway, here again, kind of a simplified version that you do a query at every point. You have a small window where you analyze the data. Then you have a key, so query and key to subsample the image and see what is the what is the similarity map based on this patch. So that's all in the training method that looks at the coherence or something over time. Uh, you know, yeah. just from my understanding, is this something that would as well work for anomaly development like a vision, do you think? Or it's more based on the functional hypothesis that you have some I, consistency. I think there is an assumption that I mean I would have to talk to Mongolia about that. 
I think in the case of pathology, we are you have a problem because then it may even smooth it out or so. So because here we assume somehow normality of contrast over time because we have a training base mm -hmm. and there is no true more or lesion involved. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think we have to rethink such networks in case for of... outlier. Mm -hmm. There are some models that you say what I think there were some learning based frameworks you could say you see which doesn't fit the model. Mm -hmm. But here I would not feed in an image that has strong uh, pathology. Mm -hmm. but maybe I think it's not just try it and then see if it works. I think mm -hmm. they have to rethink what happens if in a certain region suddenly new structures appear mm -hmm. or disappear, like in MS region. Exactly. I was yeah. thinking on MS, of course. Yeah. But I was thinking as well, I mean. Already in my thesis, I was putting this model of, of tumor growth. So yeah. it was a prior, a very yeah. basic, yeah. I would say, stupid prior, but it works nicely to just support a network. Yeah. So I was wondering in, in, if this can be either learned or inferred some, uh, some, somehow, if you know. I'm not so sure. Okay. I could discuss it, but finally, we have a well defined label map, which is really all this USF very wide. We would, as Marcel Postava, we should we have to include a new class which is like unknown exactly. and then uh, yeah. Yeah. use a different mm -hmm. yeah. okay of course you have to do ablation studies without going into details uh, to do a lot of different tests that's huge work every good learning patient you spend much more time in these ablation tests months and then the paper comes back you have to do more uh, but uh, I, I, I simplified the red box is ours and the red box is always so far. I mean, it gives you some feeling, yeah, we have achieved some something better, which is more coherent over time. So at least uh, we, we had three large databases, OASIS, IDs, infant brain imaging study, subcortical and right data brain network. Okay, so you have to believe in this database study. Sure. Uh, yeah, sure. We are. I mean, this is in a downstream path, no? Like you train cell supervised first in the longitudinal way. Let us see, I go back to uh -huh. the, the framework. Yeah. So the first part is cell supervised, no? What you are doing, so you are getting like more invariant features or so. And the simulation yeah. is then based on that, on the features you get when you have trained in the super cell supervised way, or how do you do it? Let us see, so simple. So we have, where is the template? Yeah. The pre-training prepares this patch-based system with uh, losses and only in the fine tune. Let me see, where does the template come in? We feed in a template that is already segmented. Oh, yeah, I can see the fine tuning, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it's all the first two blocks or A B C D prepare the whole image to do the patches and then come up with this uh, uh, Losses versus uh, pain, <laughs> and then only in a consistency loss, yeah, we put in the template that we know it's specific time for it. But okay, don't take my word here, but I mm -hmm. think the kind of conversation is not right. Okay, so now we applied it to supporting structures uh, because we didn't really have Martin Schiller at UNC had a system for. Uh, Multi atlas segmentation, like Paul Mishkovich and other groups, need you know, multiple atlases, you superimpose it to the image, and then you have this weight metric, mm -hmm. which is the winner at each voxel. Mm -hmm. But we didn't have that for six months only for other data. We, we said. So, okay. And then we segmented all the data. Uh, here, Down syndrome, where we know the shape of the brain is different, brain size is smaller, but not linearly. Very light matter or not, it's the same thing. It's not just a smaller brain, it's a non linearly smaller brain. Okay, and uh, we know when we do the uh, brain sweeping, here we also use the new tool by Adrian. It's the old tool. It's really working very well. Pedro is very impressed. No, it works very nicely. It works very well. I mean, for everything. So far, we always had it someone painting all the errors. And I 
We apply the different two brain shapes that are different. Even more than in life, since three parts of the three three yeah, three exactly. I would just say we started at UNC where we have somebody full time helping out, even as homework because she has two kids and so on. But, but like I said, Sin Street has so few errors. Uh, uh, but I would just say we did it because then Sin Street was doing so well that in a few days you had a whole large database script. Mm. Otherwise, you do manual corrections over months. Mm. Uh, okay, so mm. brain size, you see that from these curves, is uh, for internal cavity, that's the yellow one, for up. For uh, EP is the new study that we do for uh, redoing the autism study and confirming mm -hmm. the results. But mostly they are control like. There could be a few labor diagnoses of this. Controls are blue. At that time, we didn't have enough controls. <laughs> but two weeks ago, we just downloaded the, the latest batch from all the universities. We have now much more data. And the red one is dancing on. You can clearly see the brain itself, the interfering volume is smaller by about 15 or 18%. Mm -hmm. But then we did the subcortical structures. This is not just volumes. Next step is shape analysis of this data. If you see, this is a mixed effects modeling of the two cohorts here, EP and uh, Down syndrome. Red is Down syndrome. You see, for some for support structures, in the same volumes, mm -hmm. even if the brain is much smaller. So there's really something going on. And Kelly Butteron is the PI of the brain at uh, St. Louis at the University of Washington. She said, oh, it's all new. We don't really know. Nobody did ever make a study. We don't really know about brain growth, brain growth in autism. Uh, so some structures are the same as in the controls, which are bigger brains. And some structures will be deviated. And we could even say something further. Uh, now I have plotted it at the same uh, axis. But we could even say they look like delayed development of a child. If you would have a cohort of delayed development by a few months, then it's more shifted in age. It's graduation age versus calendar age, or whatever how you call it. Okay, so there's surely more to do. This just came out when we had to report it to the NIH. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's about longitudinal segmentation. You just tell me when I have to stop. I mean, so. I mean, principally, it was for one hour. We are yeah, already yeah. almost at one hour, but yeah. So we have to about <laughs> yeah. No, 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 I don't want to talk about everything. Uh, the, you also do diffusion imaging, isn't it? Yes. Um, so. uh, maybe I quickly show you. The, yeah, no, it was not intended uh, that I keep you busy for <laughs> two hours, but just a few snapshots, which is uh, a lot has to do with also harmonization and uh, data preparation. So in diffusion weighted imaging uh, of infants, we often have the problem that we lose data. Kids wake up or there is corrupted scans. So even if you have a beautiful connector sequence, finally, there is only two directions left. Uh, uh, I mean, this is more a eye catcher, 254 directions. You get some beautiful photography images for connect, uh, connect home, uh, mm -hmm. uh, or sometimes they have only 26 or even less. And there was always a question in our study what is the criteria? We have a table how many directions in the diffusion scans are surviving quality control? And where do you pull the plug and say, delete the data? You can say, you should not delete the data because they're so valuable. It's actually a longitudinal plug. So the, another student of mine, Hu Chang Kim, who is now at Columbia, a postdoc, uh, with Mongwei Ren, who is still at PhDC, they said, can we synthesize the missing directions? So it's more in a learning based framework. If you don't have them, can you synthesize them? And the important information, no, sure. So, yeah, here, come, 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 ah, okay. you have two screens. Sorry, yeah, we feed in actually a P2 and a P1 of the same subject and the B0 image. Okay, okay. 
And then uh, we train the network based on the full uh, angular resolution that we call this case. And then we go through and subsample, subsample the angular resolution and train the network to say, can we learn how the missing directions look like? So that's in a lay <laughs> explanation what we do to get the synthetic DWIs to fill in what we don't have in the case. So in principle, uh, uh, the network, yeah, I mean, go through an advanced style analysis because we know the truth for the learning. We take one nice data set or many, we subsample and we train how would it look like and can we synthesize the remaining. And if more than synthesizing, then we do the synthesis, we can even decide how do we subsample the sphere? Because usually you depend on the directions. Mm -hmm. and that's another problem that we often have. If only 15 directions survive out of 200, maybe sometimes they're on one part of the sphere only. So in that sense, we become completely independent of the uh, spacing of this. We could just say divide the sphere into 200, let's talk about more than talk about, but it's independent of the sampling of the sphere. So uh, the first yeah. part, sorry, the first part, the fact that you are adding the T1 and the T2 is not for a spatial encoding, it's really like to learn. To learn. The, 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 and the, the, I must say, my reaction first was then the two students presented it, uh, how can you do that? It's a mistake. I mean, how can you want to do, know about the GCPT? But on the other hand, it's just additional information using this contrast to yeah. learn how a diffusion image mm -hmm. could look like. Now you can come with your previous question, what if they have pathology? Mm -hmm. And I think that's mm -hmm. not designed for that. Mm -hmm. You just say it should be a study where we know from quality control there should be no lesions or some other visually mm -hmm. uh, detected uh, the form, not deformations, but alterations of mm -hmm. the diffusion image. Yes. Okay, and this is how the data looks like. It's in the kind of a, a very sophisticated bit of <laughs> Because the left is a reference frame where we have only about 12 directions, and you see the directions in the left view space. And then that's the generated image after we fill in the directions. Uh, here the full space for even mm -hmm. different d values. Uh, I think it's still with a very nice visualization <laughs> because I use that sometimes for a lecture of diffusion imaging, how you go through the directions and show the image. Uh, <laughs> no pressure, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just, uh, inspiration. Yeah, because if somebody doesn't know about diffusion images, how you see how an image looks like, it's yes, uh, in all yeah, sorts of directions. Different images show up. And then Naudi, uh, of course, everybody in our house tries to do Naudi, and we really need a high quality, uh, large uh, um, annual assembly protocol. Uh, and then we try Naudi and say, can we also do Naudi on subsampled images, subsampled in gradient space? I mean, the directional gradients. And uh, had a benchmark actually that was also trained in the network. So it was not just trying and saying it looks good. So we compared the values. <clears throat> so, oh, I don't have the slide here. Ah, no, here. Sorry. Uh, okay. so, sorry. 79, 26, 13. This is an extreme case. <laughs> you just say you could only survive, uh, or only 13 directions survive. We make up for the rest. 241 were synthesized to get to the same uh, gradient space oh. as the full image. And this is the original Nadi, which is so noisy and I would say it's crispy, uh, so mm -hmm. it's not even noise. And this is the image after synthesizing. And of course, you can do the different images. So that was tested by the students and published. And so, yeah. At least what the study shows, you can make up spans that you do not have to improve the quality. And now I had critical discussions with several uh, 
uh, researchers and say, what does it mean? I mean, you can even do a DTI without even using any DTI information because you synthesize it. And of course, that's not the goal here. So it's like if someone has a T1, T2 image and say, I want to have a pen image there and study. I mean, there's a machine learning framework for that. There is a, how can you get the pen image? Because that's actually information construction. <laughs> they don't say it's worse. But yeah, it's I very mean, confusing. Really, it's very different in yes. but there is still some subtle. But what we do is not that we say if they have only 10 directions, they can make 250 magically and it's perfect. We we'll just say we do quality control of the scans. We add some information that is necessary from the structural images to synthesize. And we didn't decide about the threshold. How many should be missing? And where do you give up? But on the other hand, for me, it's just an example how powerful still learning based uh, networks can be. So, yeah. so here the network was not, it didn't choose the 13 directions in training? No. But it chooses them in this training data. uses the full images, but then we corrupt the data. So in the training, we also corrupt the data and say 256 or whatever you have. We start this, but then we had lower and lower and lower number of samples, and that was in a fan based uh, real data uh, system train. So, uh, one single data set is enough for training. You train on the image itself, you don't need a thousand PWI images to pull the same image. I would say, uh, I would. If you want to learn more about it, go through the paper and then ask questions, especially in one way, which is amazing. She gives some lectures in my courses and explain what exactly happens. But you train on a single subject in that sense, how would it look like if you have subsampling? And that goes in as a loss function into the training network. Because we know the truth, because we start with a good image. Yeah. But then, of course, if you come in with a new subject, which has less directions, the training knows about how a diffusion image should look like in that sense, if they have all directions. So some, uh, like Martin Chico was very critical. So, you know, you make up some information which you may not have. We may have to validate it in a different mm -hmm. way, uh, but anyway, so that's just one of the mm -hmm. solutions to harmonize. It's just, I'm a nice diffusion in the Okay, I would say yeah, yeah, we'll I to stop my time. time and uh, just a quick remark. So longitudinal analysis, yeah, we really believe in that. Yeah. It's our message. Mm -hmm. uh, there are more and more databases failing to distribute in the train, like the infant studies and uh, adult studies. Software methodology, there's still a lot to do. So students should not feel this is all done as in other fields. Oh, there's nothing new that's in the head. There's rapid increase of clinical studies. I really want to uh, go through to the lifespan of different uh, uh, stages in life. And even if couples starts to couple statistics and modeling into the segmentation, so we don't leave it to biostatistics, we already have a very early idea of a model over time. So I think that's very important, even statistics, modeling does mixed effects, modeling on images for her training of the position segmentation. So it's not something that you leave later to some biostatistics, mm -hmm. complex modeling, it's a tell us something. You don't, it's already part of the mm -hmm. process, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which is interesting and yes. a challenge for our students to learn mm -hmm. more about it. Okay, so I would say machine learning and AI, I don't have to teach you about that. Uh, this is really uh, progress that has been made. What I see with my students and my students that I teach, applying is easy, but <laughs> I have an understanding of that. Uh, don't you think it's easy now? No, I don't need to know. I don't need to have a course no, on statistics. That 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 you first have to pass a statistics course and, and then. then <laughs> Into a machine learning class. Okay, acknowledgements go to all the NIH families uh, that we have, and uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you.
And as I said, software is available. <laughs> Uh, slice of salt for shape. That's a new information of interface net and uh, maybe slice of uh, yeah, deformation. So, yeah, mm. especially machine learning, we always find a link to open source. Yes. Thank you very much. And I'd like to open the floor for questions as well, maybe online. Here we have already a few questions, or as well here. If online the questions, can you please? Unmute. In the meantime, I'm reading a message from uh, Benedict Marechal, Mortemain of the Time. Mm -hmm. As always, very insightful and inspiring to listen to you, Guido. Okay. We unfortunately have to switch to the next meeting. Enjoy your Swiss stay, Bene, student, student at UNC with Liz in 2004. Ah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Bene, at the time, started. it was uh, Mortemain. No. Ah, Mortemain. Yes. Yeah, uh, yeah, of course, you know was her. She from CP Leon? Yes. No? Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah, because we have every every year we have students like CPU who do. Uh, yeah, I have 20 years of generation. Yeah. Yes, uh, we like them as well a lot. Yeah. A few of them. Benny was yeah. my, my yeah. student as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So she had to, to rush. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Do you have questions online or here in the room? More questions for him? No? It's all good. Okay, yeah. So online, I see a lot of people that they do rather preclinical, so a lot of uh, mouse and uh, and rats and uh, MRI and uh, yeah. mm -hmm. so, so I guess as well, longitudinal it makes a lot of sense because they have worked on animal imaging, yeah. especially in the bracket. We had a we had a bracket addiction study ah. models bracket Children exposed to drugs with the longitudinal mm -hmm. related to one year. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, there was a mouse uh, model, model for exactly. drug addiction and also over time. Mm -hmm. yeah, then we had more time for it. Yeah, so. exactly. Okay. I mean, the, all this software, longitudinal, and we just had a few snapshots. Software is the same in this, but in the process, it's separate. Yeah, yeah. And like building that on the mouse or other animals. No. It's a safety. Yeah. Maybe not so complicated to follow. Generic, unfortunately. No. Because in the early days, as you know, we may have the software for infant neonatal brain segmentation, highly specialized. You could never use it for no. three month old. But now these techniques are much more generic. No. I mean, maybe you have to tweak the networks a little mm -hmm. bit at the last function, mm -hmm. but I would say it's becoming more coherent as a team. Okay, so I would Thank say we we'll stop much. here and we will continue with some presentations from our students. Thank you everyone for attending.